This way of constructing buildings, pioneered by the Greeks, the Parthenon, on the hill named the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, was a monumental structure intended to be the home in here of a statue of a deity. And actually the statue was taken to be the deity. But this also was not a general purpose type of a structure, something that might be used for various purposes. It had a very special purpose. Let's take a look at what the Greeks learned about constructing a temple. They had to know how to measure and how to use geometry and how to cut stone accurately and how to plan certainly and to construct and to organize labor to do all of this and the area being very large 100 feet by 228 feet so this really is quite an undertaking to have been accomplished almost 500 years before Christ with the technology that was then available. Here let's take a look at one member of this structure and that is a support here and a support here by a column and then this spanning member. On one end that spanning member rests on a column on the other end it rests on a column but this is a heavy piece of stone and gravity pulls it downward. Now it turns out that when something solid like this is supported in this way the force acting down on it tends to stretch the lower surface and that stretching is definitely a force, it's in tension. Up here, because of the way the force is acting, the stone is actually being compressed. Stone is strong and can resist against compression, but it's brittle and can't resist stretching. So you do this separating these pillars too much, and this is exactly what happens. The stone is going to fracture and break. And we suspect the Greeks figured that out by trial and error. And so the distance between here and here is probably no more than, oh, 10 feet at the most, maybe 6 feet, in between this point here and this point here. Anything longer than that, and the stone, no matter how big you make it, is probably going to fracture and break. Now, in modern construction, architects do this same thing and span great distances using concrete which is very much like stone except you pour it in a fluid state and then it sets up chemically to become stone and in order to do this in modern construction a piece of reinforcing steel here is inserted and this becomes pre-stressed concrete steel can take stretching and it makes up for the weakness of concrete in that way so now with this sort of a member, quite a large distance can be spanned. And you'll see this in parking structures quite commonly. The supports for the concrete members are very widely spaced. And what you don't see is that there are cables or rods running the whole length to counteract the tension that exists by the downward pressure. Well, the Greeks didn't have this. They didn't have the ability to create uh, steel in that quantity and to use it in this way, and they probably didn't quite understand the physics involved. How are you going to span larger distances than using only stone? Well, it turns out the Sumerians figured this much out, that you could use an arch. And this distance here is much larger than the limit that you could accomplish in spanning with just a member across here. Let's see how the arch works to do this. Although the Sumerians invented it, the Greeks really didn't use it much, and the Romans perfected it and used it a tremendous amount in all their civil engineering projects, such as this aqueduct. Here's what happens with an arch. It's constructed of separate stones. These are all separate stones, wedge-shaped. And when this is constructed, there's a support down here called false work, and it's actually a lot of wood that probably looks like it's something like this and it's constructed to be a temporary support for the stones to be placed on there. So the stones are placed like this building up and after all these stones are in place resting on this false work then the keystone is inserted and you'll notice it's kind of trapezoidal shaped and what happens here is it tries to move down and by moving down this sloping side here pushes on these stones here and stone can take compression very well so here's what happens weight comes down this way 
and the force goes down like this. Every one of these stones can take this compressive force. Ultimately, the force is directed outward and downward. And then the false work can be removed. The stones are usually cemented in place, but they need not be. This whole structure would work, assuming, of course, that all this area was also filled with stone. If this were just sitting here, then it may be that things become a little bit unstable unless this area is also resisting any outward pressure. But this is exactly how an arch works. The keystone has to be sloped in this way in order for this to happen. And there has to be mass here to resist this outward pressure. Here's what the Romans did. They repeated the arch. And you can see that the force coming down this way is resisted by the force this way repeatedly. So in constructing these, they would have perhaps two or three sets of false work, and they would move the false work along to build the aqueduct. In fact, in here, they built this one first, and then they built this one and the little one on top. And this was very carefully constructed so that water could flow in a channel here. Other constructions the Romans created that we'll see in just a few seconds also used the arch. And sometimes they even used the arch in a commemorative way, simply to have a surface to put commemorative inscriptions on. The arch has come down to us as a traditional architectural element. This building was constructed in 1880, and it sits in the Chicago downtown area, right opposite the Daly Center. And you'll notice here arches and kind of an exaggerated keystone. When we look at buildings like this, it's sometimes kind of curious whether the arch is really functioning as an arch or if it's only just a decorative element. It's kind of a giveaway here that the architects who designed this building actually had the technology to span this distance using just a straight member. They didn't have to use an arch because right here is a window of the same width with a flat spanning member. Here it's fairly clear that this is being used probably as a cosmetic element and you'll notice also hiding behind this number eight and over here and around many windows are columns, which are also just decorative elements. So here we have features of ancient architecture creeping forward into more modern architecture, mainly because they were so popular in terms of the way that the arch and columns were used that people came to expect buildings to have these kinds of features. And here you see a different type of an arch located up on Fullerton, an apartment house. This also is an arch but you'll notice it's a little different. It's pointed. We're going to talk about this when we talk about the Gothic era. Architects in the Gothic era found an advantage to making an arch function in this way. Here, the keystone still has a trapezoidal shape, but it's also got this point to it that kind of covers up the fact that how, it's, how it's acting as a, a force downward here to direct this way and this way, that's exactly what this top of a pointed arch does. So the keystone here has a different shape. And here is an arch that probably is really functioning as an arch. This is on an older house constructed about 1935 or earlier in Lincoln Park down the street from our Lincoln Park campus. And the arch that you see here probably really is functioning as an arch. This stone is fairly heavy and you'll see glass couldn't possibly support this stone these walls really are load-bearing walls and this arch is functioning as an arch to make it possible to have this area here have no support at all. That is, it doesn't support anything above.